Okay, so in today's class, I want to talk about the historical and uh, theoretical foundations of uh, science uh, fiction. And I should point out right from the start that this is not going to be uh, anything close to comprehensive or exhaustive because there's so much we can talk about uh, with science fiction in terms of historical and theoretical foundations. So it is necessary to be uh, quite selective. But here are just a uh, couple of subjects I'm going to touch upon uh, science plus fiction, I mean, because that's what we're talking about in terms of the name of the genre. Uh, two major subjects in science fiction, the future and the novum. Uh, I don't know, those might be the two biggest ones, although I hate to make that kind of sweeping uh, claim. But as far as the theoretical tradition is concerned, those are the two that have been brought up a lot. The future, which we mentioned last time, that's often what we think of. When we say science fiction oriented towards the future, the novum has to do with the future, basically means new thing, new object, and you can think of that as a futuristic thing. And then some other subjects and themes in science fiction, and uh, that's where we get into that idea of selectivity. I'm just choosing a couple that stand out that I think are relevant to the course, many others that we could actually uh, talk about there. So let's dive into it. Um, in terms of dating the genre, the 1926 launch of Amazing Stories as a literary magazine, I think it's still around actually, devoted to uh, science fiction. is often cited as a specific um, inception of the genre. Now you might see some familiar names. H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, often uh, uh, considered uh, figures who were the founders of science fiction. Edgar Allan Poe actually makes it in there as well, although he's often associated more with uh, the genre of horror fiction, if you wanted to classify him, although he fits into other fields as well. Uh, I say there, though earlier works anticipated its uh, development, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in particular, I would say, um, earlier kind of romanticist novel has heavy science fiction themes in it, but uh, the codification of a genre often comes through some kind of hallmark literary publication, uh, and this, I guess, would be the one that you would cite where it's bringing together different authors who seem to have uh, been working at some kind of intersection where people were starting to identify the recurring themes ideas in their works and saying, well, this is a thing unto itself that's developing. There's an entire trend or trajectory in literature that's developing right now, brought together. And as I say, one thing that stands out is, um, like most genres, it's recent. I mean, it's a 20th century thing if you were dating it from uh, this period. When it comes to science plus uh, fiction, here is some more uh, selectivity because this is something I brought up Last time, if we're talking about the growth of the genre in the early uh, 20th century, well, it is fitting because science itself has had an um, incredible uh, century any way you look at it. And we could talk about biology, astrophysics, whatever you want to. Um, but I'm going to speak about uh, cosmology, partly because I think that's the one the, that um, overlaps with science fiction uh, most directly. Cosmology, study of the cosmos. Think of it in terms of study of uh, space everything that's out there. It's often allied with science uh, fiction and also because it's the one I'm the most interested in. Here are a couple of just general uh, themes and points. The remarkable growth of cosmology over the past 100 years, and it has had in particular a very spectacular century, has made us realize how much we can learn about the universe, space, time, so on. Everything that's out there. Everything that kind of exceeds just the uh, narrow circumscriptions of this planet. But on the other hand, the remarkable growth of cosmology has made us realize how much we do not know about the universe, space, and time. So a little bit of a paradox there right from the start. And I say, where does fiction fit into this? Uh, okay, so that's been cosmology. So why the growth of a uh, fictional treatment of it over the past 100 years? If you took the British and European cultural history course, this is intended to be a bridge of sorts. Not that I intended this at the time, but you can think of it in uh, that way. Mentioned the Enlightenment last time. Briefly touch upon it here in terms of the foundations of a growth and outpouring of uh, scientific thought. Well, this goes back, yes, to the late 18th century with the Enlightenment. But even before then, we can go back to a figure like Copernicus, 
into the 16th century with his famous heliocentric model of the universe. That means putting the sun at the center of the universe. That was something that uh, people were not aware of prior to that period. Although I should say that the sun is not really the center of the universe. We'll get into that in a little bit. But it's more accurate than the preceding model, which placed the Earth at the center of the universe. And this was a development, the Copernican Revolution. It's nice if you can be someone who has an entire revolution in intellectual thought named after you. This was a revolution brought about by scientific observation. Simple as that. It wasn't him drawing upon inherited traditions. It was using the technology that was available at the time, including telescopes. Telescopes at this, in this era would be basically the equivalent of toy telescopes in terms of what they can show you, but nonetheless revealed some interesting things. Just take your telescope and point it up at the night sky, and you will see things there which might start to clash and conflict with what you're being told by the authorities, by the religious church, so on and so forth, and that's exactly what Copernicus did. He said, wait a minute, I'm seeing things such as the fact that some of the planets have moons. Jupiter, for instance, has moons and other things looking at the moon, taking into account the dark spots on the moon, which seems to clash a little bit with the prevailing views at the time. But in terms of cosmology and the 20th century, this is where things have uh, really taken off Recently, as recently as the 1960s, cosmology as an entire branch of science was widely regarded as a speculative discipline packed with outlandish conjectures. It was a little bit uh, peripheral. There was a sense that cosmology is not a real science and that the people who were studying it were just these oddballs with all sorts of uh, wacko theories. However, its success in explaining the origins and composition of the universe has allowed it to become uh, mainstream. Cosmology has been very uh, successful since the 1960s in explaining a lot of things about the structure, the makeup of the cosmos. There you see an image, and I believe that was captured from the James Webb uh, telescope. I have to check that, actually, to make sure that that's accurate. But I think it's one of Webb's images launched just last Christmas, actually. Telescope sent out into space. This is the largest telescope ever sent out into uh, space in an orbital pattern quite far from us. There's nothing we could do to repair it if it breaks down, unfortunately. It's too far away from us right now, but is widely regarded as the successor to the Hubble telescope, which has already produced some uh, incredible images. Some revelations. What is cosmology revealed? Well, among other things, the universe began 13.8 billion years ago. That is one of its incredible insights that the universe actually had a starting point, moment of beginning. Uh, they can date it quite precisely. That, of course, opens up the interesting question of what precisely came before that moment. No answer to that question. We're cut off at a particular moment in time. And it is cosmology verifying the Big Bang Theory, as it's called. The idea that the universe emerged at this time through observations of things like the expansion of the universe, the cosmic microwave background. You don't need to know about those things, but that's some of its basic ideas. The universe looks much the same everywhere. Another one of their crucial insights, which is important to uh, how science fiction comes to representing things. This definitely is one of Webb's images. In fact, I think it was the first one that they produced. There you are looking at uh, galaxies. I think there are some stars in there, the brighter objects that are closer. But the dimmer ones are various uh, galaxies which can hold uh, up to billions of uh, stars. And it should be pointed out that this is a tiny segment of space that the Webb telescope is uh, pointing at. And it is showing us all the things that are out there in uh, deep space. And the latest estimates indicate that there could be trillions of galaxies out there in uh, the universe. Notice when you look at it, yes, there are variations in the galaxies, but the basic idea is when you look out into the deep reaches of space, you see the same things. You see galaxies, which are no doubt packed with stars, which should also have planets as well. So space is kind of homogenous in that sense. It's basically the same everywhere you look. The building blocks of the universe, that would be the elementary particles and the fundamental forces, are the same everywhere. Hence the reason that space looks the same. That's because all these things are composed out of the same uh, stuff. And science does work with that basic bedrock, this kind of idea of a fundamental foundation. 
fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces, as well as various elementary particles. And these building blocks were in place within one second of the Big Bang. That's um, an insight that's come from various technological inventions, namely the Large Hadron Collider, which can uh, create very extreme conditions, duplicating what it might have been like within one second of the Big Bang, fundamental forces and elementary particles all operational. Suffice to say, this is uh, really incredible in terms of cosmology uh, reorienting our understanding of the universe, reorienting our understanding of existence at a large, and we can kind of press against the limits of the universe. You wouldn't think that was even possible because the limits of the universe are located billions of light years away from us. I mean, the distances we're talking about are unbelievably phenomenal. And yet, nonetheless, here's another one of Webb's images uh, capturing glass Z13. Uh, Cosmologists always come up with the most creative names uh, for the different objects that they find. Um, that is a, a galaxy captured through uh, infrared. Looks like a red uh, splotch. And so it doesn't look that impressive, except when you take into account the fact that that is an object as it existed 13.5 billion years ago. How can we see that? Well, because that's how far away from us it's located. So the light has taken that long to reach us. So this is our own uh, form of time travel, looking into the past, looking into the deep past of uh, the universe. So cosmology has allowed us to uh, understand, to develop new insights into the makeup of the cosmos, into the makeup of the space, into the makeup of the universe. And yet, on the other hand, uh, it can't help but make us aware of our profound limitations. Uh, for one thing, if there are trillions of galaxies out there, that's one of Hubble's images, the Hubble telescope's images, there are trillions of galaxies out there. How many stars out there? Well, I mean, who even wants to count how many, considering star uh, galaxies have billions of uh, stars? How many planets out there? Even more. And yet, how many of these places are we actually going to visit? How many of these places are we actually going to see up close and in person? None of them right, is the answer, unfortunately, because there are just intrinsic limitations to how far we can travel. We can think about these things. We can even look at these things with our technology. But when we look into space, what we do see is this uniformity, galaxies and stars, but we don't see things up close. We can't see, well, what are the planets actually uh, like out there, or what kind of living organisms, what kind of species actually dwell on these planets. Absolutely irrefutable that there is uh, uh, living organisms, or there are living organisms dwelling on other planets. The sheer odds make that um, almost, well, just inevitable. And also, what kinds of uh, other civilizations or cultures exist out there? Well, we can think about it, we can dream about it, but unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see any of it. We have traveled to the uh, moon <laughs> so far, right? Which is a great accomplishment, but it's not very far relative to space itself. We might get to Mars. I mean, we have space rovers and space probes that can land on Mars. There is certainly an interest in putting people on Mars and also that kind of silly idea of colonizing Mars and setting up human civilization on Mars. Mars is totally toxic, though. And I mean, it's just this barren place. It'd make more sense to try and colonize Antarctica or something than Mars. But nonetheless, I think there's just that interest in kind of branching out, going a little bit uh, further but there are limits to what we're going to be able to encounter. And so, too, just limits in terms of what we're able, going to be able to uh, learn about space at large. You have to also have to consider the interesting effect that all of these ideas have had on uh, our general perception of ourselves, our kind of uh, place in the universe, our place in um, the grand scheme of things. Uh, you might remember this from uh, the British um, and European cultural history course. If you took that course, there's Ptolemy's old geocentric model of the universe dating back to the ancient classical times, which held sway for hundreds and hundreds of years, which places the Earth at the center of uh, the universe. 
And there you see, well, they knew enough to um, be aware of the different planets, or at least some of them. They have Mercury and Venus in there, um, and they have this kind of vague outside area called the Imperium, which basically means everything um, that counts just as uh, stars. However, the Copernican Revolution kind of reoriented this model, placed the sun at the center of the universe, and now we've come to the realization that we are definitely not at the center of the universe. In fact, we are nowhere close to the center of the universe. There is no center to the universe. We are occupying a space that uh, is roughly there. If you wanted to map it, that's not a real image, of course, but just a rendition of the Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy we're located in, and there's the rough position of the sun, our star, so that's basically where we're located right now, in just one of many trillions of galaxies. German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk, who writes uh, very interestingly on topics of uh, space and philosophy, says that since the time of Copernicus, humanity has endured a series of, quote, decentralizations, which basically means getting kicked out of the center into the deserted outer reaches of space. And that, I think, makes sense to me. The Ptolemaic model, if nothing else, it gave the impression that the cosmos are um, very intimately concerned with us that uh, all of space, the universe, everything kind of uh, centers on us personally and there's this kind of divine force, divine authority that oversees everything and is focused on us. Part of the Copernican revolution and then the cosmological development as well has made us realize that the cosmos doesn't give a damn about us. I mean, we are just irrelevant to the grand uh, sweep of things in terms of space and as Sloterdijk uh, kind of drolly comments, we have consequently been reduced to the, quote, idiot of the cosmos, right? Just this creature who kind of scurries around on a planet that aspires to know, know a lot more, but is really very limited. Just this kind of surface-dwelling mammal stuck on a rock in all perpetuity. So then, why science fiction taking into account um, these uh, different ideas? And keep in mind, this is just one branch of science uh, cosmology. There's a lot more we could talk about. Well, for one thing, I mean, just to start with the kind of obvious answer, the rapid expansion of science has provided so much material for literature. These kinds of uh, developments, whether they're cultural developments, social developments, or just developments in different disciplines, they give us a lot of stuff to work with. They just give us a whole abundance of new material that we can take into consideration. And so it makes sense that literary authors would draw upon the uh, interesting and exciting things that are happening within their culture and their intellectual climate, incorporate that into their uh, fiction. But maybe uh, some more, I guess you'd say, nuanced answers, uh, as what I was just saying indicates we have to use our imaginations to try and fill in a lot of the blank spots that exist in the scientific uh, text. Yes, science can tell us a lot about the structure, the composition of the universe at large, but it's not going to give us those up-close portraits. So if we want to talk about other planets or other civilizations, we're basically uh, consigned to just dreaming it up, imagining it, because we're not going to see this stuff in person, or at least probably not, unless our technology really takes a kind of drastic turn in uh, the future. So we might as well put together fictional narratives and um, different texts. There are certain things that we know conclusively we cannot see and cannot encounter. A couple of big ones, dark matter and uh, the multiverse. For instance, those are products of cosmology as well. Dark matter refers to a substance in the universe that is very abundant. They say it makes up 85% of the total matter content in the universe, and yet we can't see it. We know it's there because it's instrumental in holding spiral galaxies together, but we don't know its intricate nature because we're just not able to observe it directly. The multiverse is the idea that there are multiple universes, that that's what happened prior to the Big Bang. 13.8 billion years ago, there was another universe before that one, and probably another one before that one, and so on up to the 
infinite, just infinite different uh, universes, well, what are the chances that we are going to see or encounter another universe? Well, I put it right at zero. Right? We're not going to see these things. So we have this kind of sense not only of the different worlds out there, but we kind of know definitively that there's stuff that we're not going to encounter. So imagination, creativity, fictional text, why not bring those things in? Because we come up against not necessarily the limitations or restrictions of science, but just the, the restrictions of us. Just as these physical beings, flesh and blood with certain amounts of technology, there are just limits to what we can do. Another point, imagination and narrative are already embedded in science. We are uh, living, I would say, science uh, fiction. Now, you can see that if you uh, go to the bookstore and look at the popular science section, you'll see a whole bunch of books written by cosmologists and astrophysicists where they put into different narratives all these ideas about the beginning of the universe or different ideas on particle uh, science. There is, I would say, this movement between uh, narrative and hard uh, science but also just some of the ideas themselves. I mean, people say about certain ideas or uh, certain uh, theories, oh, that's just science fiction. And that usually is meant to indicate that something is um, really unlikely or outlandish. Well, I would venture to say that the entrenched ideas of modern cosmology are outlandish in terms of the things that they say, even when they are good science, even when they're being verified and confirm the Big Bang Theory itself is just incredible in terms of what it proposes. First of all, the idea that the universe did have a particular moment of beginning, 13.8 billion years ago, but also that the theory tells us that at its moment of inception, the universe was uh, compressed into a very small space, a tiny space, smaller than a pinhead, smaller than even an atom at an incredible level of temperature and uh, density. That's what the uh, actual official theory states. Now, uh, you can go ahead and try and picture that <laughs> if you want, right? Universe squashed into this tiny, infinitesimal little space. The many worlds interpretation is a theory from uh, quantum physics. Uh, and this, too, is a kind of a mathematical model theory, which is not completely uh, well accepted, but nonetheless has some currency, which basically says that there are many parallel universes unfolding at uh, this very moment. That there is, in fact, a kind of a dizzying process of a splitting and branching that is occurring right now, and all due to uh, events that happen at the quantum level. Quantum just means very small. So at the level of tiny elementary particles, different variations there are causing this enormous splitting and branching. There are all sorts of other universes unfolding right now simultaneously. That's one of the ideas that quantum physics uh, proposes. Sounds like science fiction, and yet it is just science. So I would say that there's uh, quite a lot of crossover and blurring of these boundaries and distinctions between what we think of as science Empirical science, observations, calculations, mathematical formulae, repeatable experiments, and fiction. Stuff where you put something into a narrative, create a story, use your imaginations, use your creativity. Uh, there's probably a lot more seepage and blurring between those areas. Probably a lot more than um, scientists would like to admit. Right? There's more of that kind of crossover. We'll get into two major subjects in science fiction. Um, any questions, ideas about anything I just said? Okay, so um, two major subjects in science fiction and um, as I said before, I guess these would be considered the sort of uh, primary um, uh, subjects, although that's of course debatable. You don't want to make any of these kinds of uh, sweeping claims. But here are two worth thinking about uh, the future and uh, the novum. Future is the one that was uh, brought up last time. If you wanted to say something really uh, sweeping about science fiction, you could say that as a genre, it tends to be oriented towards the future, that we are dealing here with literature, with uh, fiction, that is often dealing with um, future worlds. 
Now that's not always the case. Um, steampunk, for instance, is a branch of science fiction that often looks back to the past, but there's a kind of retro futurism even woven into steampunk because often there's this idea of um, reimagining the past or looking at, say, the Victorian period or the Renaissance period from a different kind of perspective. There's this idea of kind of applying futuristic thinking to the past. So this, this orientation towards the future is, is pretty, I would say, pretty pervasive in um, the genre. Let me see Ernst Bloch, who's a um, West German uh, philosopher, and uh, the main reason why he's remembered in the um, ambit of science uh, fiction is that he's the one who proposed the idea of the novum, although he probably would have been surprised to see his ideas picked up for science fiction theory because he wasn't talking about science fiction but nonetheless he has become a kind of um, philosophical foundation for the genre if you wanted to identify one. Bloch's basic idea, this was in his uh, main work, The Principle of Hope, is that philosophers, Western philosophers, are obsessed with the past. That they tend to look backwards into the past whenever they want to come up with a kind of far-reaching interpretation of humanity or being or existence. He named some people in the German tradition like uh, Hegel, for instance, Kant. He probably could have mentioned Martin Heidegger as well. He said everything that the philosophers say is typically oriented towards the past. What the Greeks said or what human history was like in the past, there's this idea we cannot really understand um, anything, any particular era or civilization or movement until it is finished, until it is closed, until it is in the past. Well, Bloch's basic idea was, what about the future? That's what philosophers should be focusing on more. They should focus on this idea of newness, because that is such an important principle in, um, well, civilization, society, culture, but also just in people's lives. The idea of the new, as he says, it circulates in the mind in first love, also in the feeling of spring. The new has nevertheless hardly found a single philosopher. So you might think about that in relation to your own life. Those feelings you have at certain moments where you're encountering something new, new experience of some sort, or you feel like you're entering a new phase of your life, there's that kind of sense of a change or a transition, some kind of transformation. It's very important in people's lives was Bloch's idea, so we should take into account that as a kind of a philosophical principle or an idea that is worth contemplating in uh, more depth. The future, the new, horizons of new possibilities, changes, transitions, and the idea of the novum, which he comes up with, is the tangible form of the new. Tangible meaning something concrete and solid. Not just a kind of dream or a fancy, but something you can uh, pick up, hold in your hands, or something that you can touch. Something that, as he says, is imaginable, achievable, but not yet comprehensible. Now, I should point out here that um, Bloch was a kind of Marxist utopian idealism type of uh, thinker. So he was thinking here about some kind of social transformation in the future, standing on the cusp of a revolutionary transition which would broach a new era for civilization, a new era for politics. The idea here is that it's supposed to be a new thing of some sort, a new social order or something concrete and material. It should be something that we can imagine, something that we can picture right now. Now that's often the challenge when we think of something that's totally new is usually something that's surprising or completely unexpected. But Bloke had this idea of, well, we've done this in the past. Just sit there and tell yourself how you see the future. Think of it in a material sense. What do you picture when you think of some kind of apparatus structure or even just an object of some sort. The people in the past picture the iPhone, for instance, as this kind of novum, a new object, something that seems to come from the future, something we can imagine, something that's achievable. I mean, again, he's a kind of Marxist utopian thinker, so I don't know if the utopia really is achievable, but of course a utopian thinker always believes that it is, right? So not something that's totally unrealistic, but something that we can actually bring about. And when you think about it in relation to science, we usually often have the sense of if it's achievable, it should be based on scientific principles in some way, some kind of empirical science. Yes, we could invent that. 
Yes, we could create that social order. Again, something to think about if you just try to envisage, imagine a future society, a future civilization. What would be your idea of a utopian social order? Dream that up, imagine that, picture something material, and then ask yourself, do I believe it could be achieved? Do I actually believe that that's something that would come about? but not yet comprehensible in the sense that we can't really wrap our minds around it yet. It's something that, yes, we can think about, but it's also something where we couldn't really see the implications of it. We couldn't really see all the ramifications that would come from this kind of social order because it's just at the level of imagination right now, even though it's something concrete. So that's Bloch's basic idea of the novum. So they say it means no new thing is basically how you just translate that into a term, a new thing that emerges in the world. In a sense of the novum, and here we have the kind of issues with the future. There's a recent viral image of an Italian magazine a story published in 1962, which supposedly uh, predicted the future. Well, it didn't, but that's, that was the idea for a little while. Um, and this was all placed in relation to COVID because that looks like a lot of uh, social distancing measures of people locked in their uh, little uh, capsules. Well, the story, the actual original story, was not about predicting the future. It was um, a postulating that here is a means of transportation in the future, which it could still come about in some form to reduce traffic congestion. I mean, that's basically the idea here. So here you have a kind of novum, right? Someone in the past is dreaming up a kind of image of the uh, future. But I think it's really telling and fitting that it was kind of brought into the COVID narrative because that really is, is apropos and uh, pertinent. A novum allows us to build a concrete picture of the future, and yet we cannot see the future. I mean, that's one of the truths of life, and many of our predictions uh, turn out to be wrong. And something like COVID is a case in point, right? There are various people out there who would probably say, well, um, epidemiologists, for instance, who would say, well, I was warning people. I was warning politicians about the possibility of the spread of a virus, a pandemic, and other people could say, well, you just look at the uh, political state of affairs in the world today and you know a global phenomenon will be usurped and distorted in political discourse. In retrospect, it's easy to say, well, yes, this was not entirely unexpected. This could have been predicted. And yet, who really did predict it? I mean, the world basically ignored COVID all the way up until spring of 2020. And then suddenly it was the biggest story in the world. I think there's usually that sense that uh, we're blindsided by the future. There are things that happen that seem very abrupt and unexpected. So too with the uh, internet digitization, even when the internet was already a thing in the mid-1990s. Yes, I do remember that era. People still did not fully anticipate the scope and the reach of it. They didn't really understand the transformative impact it was going to have. And you can see that. Look at all the corporations and companies that went bust due to their inability to adjust to the internet age, due to their inability to adjust to digitization. I say there at the bottom, often both our current predictions as well as retroactive assessments of old predictions focus on questions about whether it would be good if this or that novum came to pass. So things are brought into that sort of political and ethical domain. That's why I say this story is really fitting because it's a story that ends up being about COVID restrictions and measures and social distancing. And there's this idea, well, this magazine predicted it. Is this a good vision of the future or a negative vision of the future? I mean, it kind of depends what side of the aisle you're on, right? People saying, oh, great, wonderful, social distancing measures, and other people saying, oh, it's horrible, it's dehumanizing, separates people. That ends up being the heart of the debate, and that's part of the reason why it became a viral story, not because it was accurate, because it just tapped into how people are seeing things in the present uh, moment. So when we're predicting things that are going to happen in the future, there is, I think, usually this just obsession with the idea of, will that be a better future or will it be a worse future? If that particular piece of technology or that new social order comes to pass, will it be uh, positive or will it be uh, negative? And we just paint things in that kind of simple binary way, even though in the end it ends up being a lot more uh, complicated than that. So we'll get into talking about um, 
the Novum for Science Fiction. Uh, let's take the break now, so we'll come back in uh, uh, 10 minutes and get into that topic.